Welcome, USF students, families, alumni, faculty, staff, trustees, and community members. Please take your seats. The program will begin shortly.
A reminder that the use of flash photography and audience use of cell phones or other recording devices during tonight's presentation is prohibited. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to the Silk Speaker Series presents Leadership and Legacy. An evening with Dr. Clarence B. Jones and Sterling K. Brown in partnership with the Institute of Nonviolence and Social Justice. And now, please welcome to the stage Eileen Fung, Interim Provost and Vice President of Academic Affairs at the University of San Francisco. Hello, USF community. Welcome. My name is Eileen Jiajing Fong, the Interim Provost and Vice President of the Academic Affairs here at USF. It is my pleasure to welcome you here tonight to this exciting and meaningful event. The Silk Speaker Series at USF brings key thought leaders to campus and is designed to provide learning opportunities and discussion for USF students, alum, faculty, and friends of the university. The Distinguished Speaker Series is made possible thanks to the philanthropic partnership and sponsorship of Mr. Jeff Silk, USF Class of 1987. <laughs> Jeff and his wife Naomi helped to bring the Silk Speaker Series to USF so that we can hear from inspiring individuals like those we are about to see today. I would also like to thank Jeff and Naomi for their support in launching a new financial literacy program for middle school high schoolers in partnership with our USF McCarthy Center. The purpose of this initiative is to advance financial freedom and economic, economic liberation for youth from multiply marginalized communities by developing and implementing a culturally relevant financial literacy program. Tonight, with gratitude to the Silk family, we highlight the transformative work of the USF Institute for Nonviolence and Social Justice and the life and legacy of the Institute's founding director emeritus, Dr. Clarence B. Jones. We appreciate your generosity to USF and the USF Institute for Nonviolence and Social Justice, and we celebrate the huge impact that Silk Speaker Series continues to have on students, alumni, and the entire USF family. Without further ado, Mr. Jeff Silk. Eileen has one of the hardest jobs on campus, and that is being the provost. And we cannot thank you enough for all of your hard work, dedication, and care for all of our students. For those of you who don't know what the provost does here, the provost is in charge of, basic, in charge of our academics to think about student success, curriculum innovation, faculty excellence, and most importantly, to make sure that our students are prepared for taking on the world after they graduate. Anyways, thank you very, very much, um, Provost, and um, thank you for the introduction. <clears throat> Welcome to the University of San Francisco. And to the Silk Speaker Series, thank you so much for being here tonight. My name is Jeff Silk, and I'm a graduate of the university, and I'm also a member of our Board of Trustees. My son Ashton is also a graduate here of the university. And let me just pause for a second and say how proud I am to be part of the University of San Francisco. It, 
seems only appropriate that since we're all here on this beautiful Tuesday night, that we do a big round of Go Dons. So I'm gonna count to three, and then as a group, as loud as we possibly can, if we all say Go Dons together. Ready? One, two, three. Go Dons! That was awesome. My wife, Naomi, Naomi, uh, Naomi and I started the, Spil the Silk Speaker Series with a goal of being able to enhance what our students are learning in the classroom, to bring our alumni back to campus, to connect our students and alumni together, and to shine a bright light on the University of San Francisco so the rest of the world can see what a great place the University of San Francisco is. Our hope is that through these events, our students, our faculty, our staff, our alumni, our greater community are able to learn from our speakers and to give our students a better understanding of the world. Tonight, we get to hear from some very special individuals who will certainly help us better understand the world. I am very excited and also extremely honored to be able to introduce tonight's speakers. First, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Professor Stephanie Sears. Professor Sears is Associate Dean of Social Science for the College of Arts and Science and a member of our sociology faculty. The next person I would like to introduce is award-winning actor Sterling K. Brown. So what most of you probably don't know is prior to being in this room here tonight, Sterling was with a group of students, talking to them, answering their questions, and uh, Naomi and I had the chance to peek our head in, and he was wonderful with our students, and so um, thank you to Sterling for doing that. You probably know Sterling from his role in long-standing NBC drama, This Is Us. He received multiple awards for the role, including an Emmy for Outstanding Actor in a Drama Series. Sterling also made history by becoming the first African-American actor to receive a SAG Award for Outstanding Male Actor in a Drama. Recently, Sterling was nominated for an actor, for an Oscar for Best Supporting Actor for his role in American Fiction. Yes, in the house tonight. And I'm sure we'll all be watching the Academy Awards, and I'm sure we'll all be rooting for Sterling. Sterling Kane Brown is truly a star of the stage, of film, and in telev and television. And I'm just so thrilled and honored for him to be here at the University of San Francisco tonight. And finally, I would like to introduce Dr. Clarence B. Jones. Clarence is the former lawyer, political advisor, draft speechwriter for Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr.
Dr. Jones is credited for writing the first seven paragraphs of the iconic speech, I Have a Dream. He has authored several books. His most recent book, which hopefully all of you have, is The Last of the Lions. Dr. Jones received the Thurgood Marshall Award from the American Bar Association, which is the highest recognition given by the ABA. And it turns out he was awarded this honor at a ceremony where the keynote speaker was former President Barack Obama. Some of you, if you've been around here for a while, may have seen Dr. Jones on campus. Dr. Jones was part of our faculty here at the university for over a decade. Dr. Jones is also the co-founder and director emeritus of the University of San Francisco Institute for Nonviolence and Social Justice. So, if everybody would help me give a big University of San Francisco welcome to tonight's speakers. Cleaner than the Board of Health. No, man, I'm trying to be like you. What you no, talking no, about? No. <laughs> <laughs> Glad you're done. <sighs> wow. Hello, everybody. How is everybody? Thank you, Jeff, so much for the warm introductions and for all you do for USF. I am so honored and absolutely excited um, to moderate this conversation this evening with two amazing human beings um, and to talk about legacy and to talk about leadership. Um, one of the things in thinking about tonight's conversation, we realized that Dr. Jones and Sterling are two men who span different generations, different fields of professional life, yet who have common experiences and some really interesting synchronicities that bring them together. So a couple things before I get started, um, I have to say something. I was raised by my grandmother, and I was raised never to interrupt my elders. And um, Dr. Jones and I have had a conversation, so I have great home training. And um, Dr. Jones has lived 93 years, and there is no... <laughs> you know, there is absolutely no way in the time that we have this evening that we can even scratch the surface of his experiences. So I may have to be a little directive, uh, but that's right, that's okay, right? Yes, whatever See? you say. Between y'all, man, See? I'm good. See, <laughs> See? So I wanna encourage you all, you can be a nerd like me if you'd like, but get the book, lots of tidbits and Great nuggets book. in here. <laughs> so. Um, you, what we may touch on, you can follow up on in the book. So let's get started. Y'all ready? Yes, ma'am, let's ready? do this. 
Okay. We can count it okay. down. Look at that. Okay. Clock. Okay. I know. I know. I know. The clock is a lot. So, each of you has a public persona that you perform. Hmm. Sterling, as an actor, you represent and bring to life the role or character created by a playwright or screenwriter. Dr. Jones, especially in your role as a lawyer, you are often called to represent your client or cause. Dr. Jones, many people know you as MLK's lawyer. And Sterling, many people, myself included, know you as Randall Pearson from This Is Us. <laughs> Right? Right? What does that respective role mean to each of you? And has it been a challenge to define yourself outside of that role? Dr. Jones, can you kick us off? Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously very, uh, very proud to have had uh, played some role in the life of Martin Luther King Jr. And I won't say but, but and. Uh, you know, I was also honored to serve as a uh, lawyer and uh, legal advisor for James Baldwin, mm -hmm. for Lorraine, mm -hmm. for Harry Belafonte. Yes. Uh, advisor to Malcolm X. For yeah. uh, um, Ozzie Davis. Mm -hmm. For um, um, oh, and 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 interestingly, of course, for. For Brother Malcolm, for Malcolm X. That's right. That's right. That's right. In fact, uh, in fact, I don't want to take too much time, but uh, if you read the book, I was with the, uh, I was with Malcolm X with uh, Dr. John Henry Clark, who was a great uh, African American historian. I was with the Malcolm X on uh, the night before the Sunday yes. of his assassination. Yes. And. Uh, and Malcolm used to say, it was, it was football season, you know, I played football. And Malcolm used to say, now you're going to promise me you're going to come to the Audubon Ballroom tomorrow? I said, no, I'm not going to promise you. <laughs> I said, if I can, if it depends on who's playing. I said, I, I don't want to, I want to watch professional football. <laughs> and uh, anyway, it's a long story, but um, um, Malcolm X was um, an extraordinary person. People said, well, how can you represent Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X? I said, well... Uh, you uh, apply your best skill sets, your best knowledge. And uh, quite frankly, um, Malcolm used to ask me the same question. <laughs> Martin used to ask me the same question. In fact, Malcolm once said to me, I, I'm going to give you a note. I want you to take the... I don't want you to take the to Dr. King. He says, you don't have to give me a note. Just tell me what it is. Right. No, no, no. I said, no. Just tell me what it is. He says, no, I insist you write it down. So I had to write down. And then the note, what Malcolm said uh, that I should give to Martin, he says, uh, Dr. King, when just, if, if you're at a certain point in the speech in your audience and you feel that they're not listening to you, what I want you to say to them is that if you don't listen to you, they're going to have to deal with Malcolm X. <laughs> and that's, that's, that's effective. That's, that's, that's effective, right. right? I gave him the message. I, Sterling, what about you? I know. How do you come after yeah. that, right? How do you come yeah. after? So, and you know, I, I, just, just, I was hanging out. Right? No, I was no, hanging can out. I just yeah. can, I, can I just say something yes, here? Yes, absolutely. Right. <laughs> now, no, 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 let me, no I, I'm 93 years old, but let me tell you something. No, 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 that's not the point. The point. Yes. The point. What, what would you like to say? You want, Jones? what I want is that you talk about, I never thought that I'd be privileged to live, to see in real life and flesh the generational genius mm. of someone like Sterling. Mm. Okay, but I never thought I would see it. I never thought, you know, yes, I lived, I lived, uh, and God bless, I love Lorraine Hansberry, God bless, I love James Baldwin, but I never thought that, that, that providentially I'd be blessed to sit in the same room. You better stop. No, no, <laughs> no, no, no. I watch television, brother. You're not going to get me to blush. This is as no, dark no, as no, I no, can no, get. No, 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 I, I watch television. And I'm saying to myself, 
You know, that dude, that dude, he, he ain't, I mean, he ain't playing. Right. He's, you're a serious brother, man. Thank you, sir. You're serious. Thank you. Serious. you. Uh, let's see. <laughs> yes. Um, I, I love the role of Randall. I had a wonderful time playing him for six years. Uh, I will say I'm not Randall. Mm -hmm. And so I always try to disabuse people of that by playing roles that are wildly different than Randall. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think the last time, like somebody came up to me and was like, you're like America's dad. I was like, the last black dude who got cast in that role. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so I try to disabuse people of that idea. I'm, I'm just a man um, yes. who loves what I do, right. who loves to illuminate the human condition, who is inspired to entertain, to educate, to edify who sees it as his ministry, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. Some people are behind the pulpit, some people use a pen and paper, uh, you know, investment banking, pen and paper, starting the Apollo, Showtime at the Apollo, like the man and done some things. <laughs> I just try to pretend to be people. Right. <laughs> and for some reason, people respond to it, you know what I mean? So I, I think living your life uh, in authenticity um, is probably the most important thing. So the role gives me a platform in order to be able to share, you know, myself with the world. But then once I get that platform, you just try to be true to yourself. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one of the places and one of the spaces I want to go is really to talk about growing up. Yeah. Right. So again, similarities and differences. Right. Um, Sterling, you grew up in a large family, and even your mom adopted other kids, yeah. right? Dr. Jones, you were an only child who spent a significant portion of your childhood in a boarding school um, or orphanage for Navajo and Negro boys. Um, but there's also some interesting parallels. Uh, Sterling, you lost your father when you were 10. Dr. Jones, while you lost your father much later in life, you lost your mother during your first year, your final year in college, right? Each of you have spoken or written about your deep and close relationship with your mother. Um, Sterling, yeah. what role did your mother play in making you the person you are today? Uh, my mom's everything. She, uh, she, first of all, education was something of an, an incredible value for her. So she was a public school teacher in the district where we lived, and she saw how the young black men she felt were being tracked along the lowest common denominator and just sort of graduated and to go out, get a job, and, and live. No one was really being encouraged to pursue a career, mm -hmm. right? And so she, she made me go to uh, St. Louis Country Day, and in that, in that space, I was able to be an athlete and an artist, and there was no stigma attached to it because everybody was doing everything at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, when I went to Stanford, there's no rivalry. I can say Stanford, right? Um, <laughs> when, I, when I went to Stanford and uh, I did my first play, which uh, Professor Harry J. Elam directed, who was there, and he's now the president of Occidental College. Uh, it was Joe Turner's Come and Gone, and I went to a predominantly white school, and so it was the first time I got a chance to play a character that was written to be black. Mm. And it felt like stepping into home. I felt um, just like, wow, I never had a chance to do this before. And so after a couple of years of doing it, I was an economics major. I was planning to go, you know, be like you, sir, and do investment banking and ball out or whatnot. But every time, every time I would go home to my internship at the Federal Reserve Bank in St. Louis, Missouri, I was not inspired, but when I was on stage, mm -hmm. I was. Mm -hmm. And so it took a couple of years for me to realize that the hobby was actually the calling. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I called my mom. I said, Mama, I'm thinking about changing my major. And she said, OK. I said, I'm thinking about changing it to drama. And she goes, she goes did you pray about it? I knew she was going to ask <laughs> me. <laughs> and I said, yes, ma'am, I did. Mm -hmm. And she said, that's how you feel led? And I said, yes, ma'am, I do. And she said, go with God. And has been nothing but supportive mm -hmm. from, from that moment on. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, when you're doing something that's not the expected path, right? It's, it's sort of the road less chosen. When your mom has your back, yes. even when everybody else is like, what is this Negro doing? Mm -hmm. 
right? Mm -hmm. You sort of have the confidence to be like, my mama cool, so mm -hmm. we cool. Mm -hmm. My mama's awesome. Mm -hmm. She's awesome. Mm -hmm. After you, sir. Mm -hmm. After you. Mm -hmm. well, I, um, my parents were a domestic household service. My mother had a seventh and eighth grade education. My father had a fourth grade education. There came a point in time when I was about six years old. They were, they were domestic household servants, and I don't know whether the people that they work for said when I was six that you ought to do something with Clarence. But in any event, mm -hmm. make a long story short, from the age of six to 14, um, 10 and a half months, 11 months, 10 and a half months a year, I was raised in a uh, Catholic uh, boarding school by the um, run by the Order of the Blessed Sacrament, mm -hmm. who also ran uh, schools in Arizona for uh, um, Native Americans. So I went to school. 20, 20 15 percent of the student body were um, Native American. Um, but during that, um, I used to kid uh, Dr. King. I said, I was raised by Catholic nuns. And you're a Baptist preacher. And I, 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 the, the Catholic nuns used to say to me and other boys, but I remember what they said to me. Six to 14, Master Jones, be a good boy. Mm. We love you. Mm -hmm. Jesus loves you. Mm -hmm. And you were beautiful. Mm -hmm. Master Jones, be a be good, good boy. boy. We love you. Jesus loves you. And you are beautiful. Mm. Now let me no 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 let me tell you something. Now you take a six year old, I was six years old, you know, and then you come six, seven, eight. So when I was younger, you know, I'd be looking up at these nuns, and then I got older. Mm. So from six to fourteen, mm -hmm. when I got to high school. The thing that I remembered, I forgot all about those other things, except I remembered that I was beautiful. Mm. <laughs> you understand? Know yes. And I tried to be a good boy. Uh. Okay? But when I got to high school... Dr. Jones. <laughs> when, I, when I got to high school, 70% white. Dr. Jones. 30% black. Right. Okay. Oh, my God. <laughs> you understand? Know Okay, uh, I, do, I still I believed I was beautiful. I know you did. Okay, <laughs> and I graduated. <laughs> I, I, I graduated at the at top of my class, president of the honor society. Yes. Okay, and got uh, a full ride scholarship to Columbia to an Ivy League school, yes. Columbia. Yes. University. Yes. Okay. Actually, I want to talk about education. All right. See, Dr. Jones, you just set me up beautifully. Um, so both of you went to elite universities, right? Dr. Jones, you went to Columbia in the 1950s when it was all male and, uh, what, 99% white? Yeah, there were, yeah, there were, yeah, yeah, there were 3,000 men in the, all, the whole university. Mm -hmm. And uh, in my class, there were about uh, 19 or 20 Negroes. Okay. Okay. And, and all to... of the other nineteen, they're all parents were professionals. Okay. Mm. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. I was the only child of domestic household servants. Right. Okay. Right. Wow. I also learned one other thing there. When I was in my um, choosing what classes I was, when I was told to go find out what classes I'm going to be assigned to, I looked, and I hear somebody stand behind me. I lived in Hartley Hall, there's a place called um, Hamilton Hall, and I go and look, and I hear somebody say, Jonesy boy, you are really using a, a profane word. Mm -hmm. I said, what do you mean? He said, don't, don't you see, I said, well, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, you're in classes with all of those kikes. Oh. So I said, well, what's a kike? Right. A kike is a Jew boy, dummy. How did you ever get into Columbia? You don't know what a kike is. I said, well, I, I don't know. And I said, well, why does it matter? 
He said, well, go and look at these high schools in which, now I, come from, I came from a high school in New Jersey. Right. So Stuyvesant High School didn't mean anything to me. Bronx High School of Science didn't mean anything to me. Right. Brooklyn Boys didn't mean anything to me. But it's the first time I ever heard the word kike right. being used and identified as being Jewish. Right. So guess what? Guess what? what? Who ended up in my, who ended up being my closest friends? Are when I was know? at Columbia, who ended up? Who? The Jewish students. Uh, that's right. Hello. <laughs> that's right. That's and that's right. why, because I would be invited home uh, many weekends, that's why I learned to speak Yiddish. When I was, oh yes. Jonathan, Jonathan, Jonathan knows. Jonathan knows, I, you know, I, I know, I know a lot of, I don't know as much Yiddish as I did then, but I knew a lot of Yiddish. He's a match. Well, I know. Oh, yeah, I know. Dr. Please, Jones, I, Dr. Jones. Well, let me switch to Sterling for a second. So, <laughs> do what you got to do, Steph. I'm trying. Twenty-six fifty. You Come see, on. I'm What's trying. Going? I'm working up here. Oh, I'm, I'm working. sorry. I'm sorry. No, no. It, you You're know good. what, Dr. Jones, you are a national treasure. Amen. And so, Amen. it is. We are honored to hear you and your life story. So, we're joking, but you know that. I, I just want to say, I, I tell that story. Yes. Because I am mindful where we are. Yes. We're in a Catholic Jesuit university. Yes. Okay? Yes. But let me tell you something, okay? I have, I've grown up and I've heard every slur that can be made against a Catholic. Yes. I've heard every slur that can be made against a Jew. Yes. Okay? Yes. I've heard it all. Yes. All right? And as a result of the education I got from those Irish Catholic nuns mm -hmm. in the age 6 to 14, mm -hmm. I am, have been committed to the pursuit of excellence. Yes. And that has been the dominant character of my life as an academic and in the pursuit of knowledge. Yes, yes. I'm going to come back to that, but before we do, um, so Sterling, yes, you went to Stanford. Um, shout out Chocolate Cardinals. Yes, All right. <clears throat> Nerd Nation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, during the 1990s, mm -hmm. right? At a time when there was more racial diversity and inclusion. In addition, you both studied at prestigious and premier performing arts conservatories. Dr. Jones, as a talented clarinetist, he also played with... Charlie Parker. I know, I know who it was. I just wanted you to say it. 17 and a half years old. 17, I 17 and a half, I know. Old. And you attended the Juilliard School of Music in a summer program. And then Sterling, you attended the Tisch School of Performing Arts. So I'm wondering, Sterling, if you can talk about the impact of your education at these premier institutions yeah. and what impact that's had on you and how you move forward in life. Uh, let's see. It's had a huge impact. I think an investment in human capital is never a waste of time. And I think a lot of people who want to pursue something in the arts think they're like, how come I don't just go to work or go straight to LA or whatnot? You can. Different paths, different strokes for different folks. But I think an investment in human capital never returns void. You're going to get something out of it. Uh, it gave me the confidence in terms of what I wanted to do. I knew I had talent. I felt raw. Mm -hmm. I wanted to have a set of skills that I knew I could take from role to role to help sort of like chart um, a course of action in terms of how to tackle a role each time. Uh, I would say even more so than the education itself, the way tr people treat you when you say where you went to school or what have you is really fascinating because whether I'm intelligent or not, people give me the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. Yes, <clears throat> absolutely. Which I think is, is not always the case when you look like us, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so if you say, you know, yeah, whatever. But, like, but if you say it, right, like all of a sudden people will, will say up and be like, oh, oh, you went to Stanford? Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, why are you so surprised, dog? Like, it's all good, you know? <laughs> so it, 
it does, it opens doors in just that way. I think for me too, in terms of both institutions and just finishing uh, education at a higher level, it gives you the confidence to know that you can finish what you start. It gives employers the confidence of knowing that you can finish what you start. And so there is a, a degree of reliability with that degree that you have in yourself and that the world at large has in you as well. So yeah. I'm going to let Agreed. Dr. Jones talk. Agreed. Agreed. Um, I guess, Dr. Jones, did you have a mentor or when you were moving through Columbia and sort of charting your path, did you have a mentor, a role model, someone to help you navigate that journey? Well, I, uh, one of my, uh, one person who influenced me very much was Paul Robeson, but I want to go back to the Juilliard School for a yes. moment. Yes, yes. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, the Juilliard had a profound impact on me uh, because um, um, I learned that the, the, the uh, the, the, the courses I took in ear training mm. is, when, is when I first early on began to see that there was a strange correlation between words and notes. I don't want to get too technical, but the note A has 440 vibrations per second. The note A, mm -hmm. the note C has 426 vibrations per second. And one of the things I, that I thought, and I know, has enabled me to be a better speech writer than most mm -hmm. is because when I write, I write words, but I write words as if they were also musical notes. Mm. Mm -hmm. So I'm very mindful of how the word is going to sound when it is spoken. Mm -hmm. In fact, Dr. King used to say to me, you know, you're scary, Clarence. I said, what do you mean? He said, you, you, you have me saying, pause and repeat. Yeah. I said, you got into my head. I said, well, you got to go to Juilliard School of Music now to do that. <laughs> do you want to say anything about Paul Robeson? Oh, wow. Oh, this, you know, um, I had, I had uh, uh, Charles White, a Cubist uh, artist, artist. Mm -hmm. Charles and Fran Wright were very close friends of Paul Robeson. And I, uh, I was a student at Columbia. And, uh, and uh, I met Paul. Uh, I, I, I saw Paul Robeson at their home. Mm -hmm. And I was telling Mr. Robeson about, uh, uh, I was active on a campus on so-called progressive activities. But my uh, friends would complain because on Saturday, when they would be handing out leaflets, I'd be playing football, mm -hmm. okay? And so I told Paul Robeson a story, and I never will forget. Paul Robeson said, young man, Brother Jones, you go back and you tell your friends, your white progressive friends at Columbia, you go back and tell them that one touchdown by a Negro on Saturday at Baker's Field mm -hmm. with 40,000 people. Mm -hmm. One touchdown by a Negro is going to have greater impact than anything they put on those leaflets. Mm. Your stuff, you should go back and tell them. Right. So really, I said, yeah. And so, now I, I played football because in addition to having a, uh, a full ride um, thing at Columbia, I, I had a great appetite. And I learned that if you played football, the food they served there were great. <laughs> so I played football, um, you know, because I loved eating at the football training table. And Lou Little, I'll just tell you one thing. True story. I was, I, I'd, be, I'd be in, now the old thing was called the T formation. Mm -hmm. I remember playing against Army, and, uh, and we're in formation. True story. And I hear these linemen saying, nigga. Will you get that ball? We're going to kick your ass. Mm. That's the way they talk. Mm. You know? And so I said, well, you got to catch me first. <laughs> <laughs> now, the coach always told me in the T formation, Jonesy, don't, don't try to be a hero. Don't, don't get the ball and run. Always get the ball and run to the sidelines. That's what I would do. So, and I, I, I learned, you know. Uh, that was a very good experience. Mm. 
He was a, he was a um, strange, strange, uh, uh, he was so powerful. Uh, you know, he, 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 went to, he went to Columbia Law School. Mm -hmm. Okay, he went yeah. to come as a lawyer. As a lawyer, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. an all-American football player. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. And he was towering. He was intimidating. And um, I would say that W. E. Du Bois and Paul Robeson. I remember walking into a reception they were having at W. E. Du Bois, and I was at Columbia. And I'm standing outside, just seeing W. E. Du Bois, and he's in this three-piece suit, pinstripe suit, and he's got a pocket watch, and I'm looking at the adulation that all these people had, and I remember the impact of seeing Paul Robeson perform in public places, and seeing, and the brother could sing in different languages. Mm. Paul Robeson could sing in, you know, he could sing in, Greek, he could sing in Yiddish, he could sing in French, he could sing. Um, had a profound uh, impact. I write in my, and by the way, uh, I just want to, you know, The Last of the Lions, do we know where the title comes from? No, where's it come from? It's a, it comes from a Nigerian proverb mm -hmm. that says, if the surviving lions don't tell their stories, mm. the hunters will get all the credit. Mm. Wow. wow. That's why it's called a lesson. Wow. Wow. So I'm going to shift a little bit. Okay. And Sterling, if you want to add some information about maybe role models that you've had or mentors as you've navigated your journey. Sure. Um, but I'm actually going to shift a little bit because you both touched on race and racism. And we both so, touch on what? Race and racism. Oh, hello. I, I'm just saying. <laughs> you, you brought it up. Yes, I know a little so, bit about that. <laughs> so the beauty, I think, of this conversation tonight is that it's really an intergenerational conversation yeah. between black men who were shaped by similar and different racial constraints, different racial norms, different ways of being, and even different ways that black folks were called. You know what I'm saying? So you sure. started talking, Dr. Jones, about one point I think you were colored. Then you were Negro. Then I think you became, what, Afro-American? But then maybe you went to black. Right. Now you're African-American, right? So, so you each sort of are sitting at different moments in history. And so I'm curious um, if you could talk about sort of your how race and racism have impacted you, but I'm actually gonna shift it a little bit different. Okay. And Sterling, I'm wondering if you could think about this really um, based on your recent film, American Fiction. So if you could tell us a little bit about the film, American Fiction, and sort of the ways in which race and racism sort of shaped that narrative in the publishing industry, yeah. and then speak to maybe how that shapes you and has impacted you as an actor. Okay. So, otherwise, race and racism is like got some China. Yeah, let's try to <laughs> focus it a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. American fiction is um, uh, Jeffrey Wright plays uh, the main character. He's Thelonious Monk Ellison, and he's a writer. Dang, yeah, shout yeah. out, shout him out. He is a writer of fiction, and he's also a college professor. And his books haven't been selling incredibly well because he's very sort of highbrow in, in terms of the type of literature he likes to put into the world. Uh, there is a writer played by Issa Rae. Her name is uh, Centara. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> she ain't insecure. She's not as insecure as she tries to let on. Um, <laughs> and she puts out a book that's sort of like written in dialect like we, we, we is in the ghetto or something, right? Mm -hmm. And it's... It's what Monk considers sort of drivel for the lowest common denominator, and it sort of travels in black pain and trauma and sort of hood tales of overcoming adversity, et cetera, right? So the central sort of theme of, of the movie is talking about in the publishing arena, as well as in Hollywood, that the kinds of stories that are told over and over again depicting black life 
tend to be rather narrow. They're either slave narratives, stories about drugs in the hood, you know, single moms overcoming adversity, fathers, absentee fathers, et cetera, et cetera. And so what the movie is talking about it is a satire, because it's comedy. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't sound real funny right now, but it's a comedy. <laughs> it's funny. Um, about why these particular stories are told over and over again and not any other kind of story with regards to black life. Mm -hmm. So it sort of like narrows down for mainstream consumption what black life is. Now I can say in my time, because it's, my tale is, is very sort of working to middle class, my mom being a school teacher, my dad being a grocery clerk at Kroger stores, Kroger's not on the West Coast, it's in the South. Yeah, it's um, Midwest, yeah. But the idea, so often I have encountered people who will be like, you're black, but you're not like black, black. Mm. Mm. And they, they, they think they're saying something <laughs> incredibly kind <laughs> and, and well-meaning. And it's like, no, you just haven't experienced me, right? right? Like, you haven't had any sort of personal interaction, and then you've seen this, right? Mm -hmm. Whether you're a big fan of Boys in the Hood, A Menace to Society, whatever it is, these are all wonderful films that I enjoy very much, but they do not exclude my life as not being black, right? right? And so when I first got to, to Hollywood from New York, where I think there was a greater appreciation in New York for transformation and being an actor, let's see your work, like if you go into LA or whatnot and you go in for something, you have to go in and fool them into thinking that you are the part. And before I learned that lesson, I would get things like, oh man, he's gotta lose that smart black guy thing. Like he's gotta, <laughs> once he can shed that, then he can start playing stuff. Because evidently I was not black enough for their white gaze. Ooh, okay. um, or what they consider to right. be the, right. the authentic black experience. <laughs> I was like, oh, do tell me, white sir. <laughs> How, how best is it for me to be black? Yes. So it was a very sort of narrowing thing, and I, I'm, I'm happy that the, the, the movie is written and directed by a brother by the name of Cord Jefferson, and he is out of sight. Um, got nominated for Best uh, Adapted Screenplay and, and for Best Picture. And so I'm, I'm excited by the prospect that more stories are getting to be told of a, a wider breadth of black experience, because I think when you see that, you see that these stories are human stories and that they are not that different from everybody else's story. And you can be black and see yourself inside of it, mm -hmm. and you can be Asian, and you can be white, and you can be, be Latino, but you're like, oh, this is a human story. And so I'm, I'm just ex excited and hopeful for the idea that people will stop rolling up on me and telling me I'm not black, black. Yes. <laughs> Let me just yeah. let me just say yes. let me just, let me just say as I listen to this I, I'm sorry I haven't seen them. It's quite movie, all right. but no I'm going to see it as soon as I can. I believe. But the point is no. But I'm, I'm listening to you, and I'm thinking to myself. I, I was one of James Baldwin's lawyers. Yeah. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, if James Baldwin could just hear what you just said. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because in the fire next time, yes. in the fire next time. Yes, sir. That, he's talking about, he's writing about, actually it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a note to his nephew. But the fire next time is seeking to interpret the black experience, not only to a, a black audience, but to a white audience that has really little knowledge of what the black experience is. Right. Okay. And as I sat there and listened to you, I could hear James Baldwin talking. Mm. Dr. Jones, you better wow. stop all this, man. Listen to me. As I sat there, as I'm sitting here and listening to you. <clears throat> yes, sir. I was there. I was there. I could hear James Baldwin talking. You know, there was a meeting that, uh, that the, um, James Baldwin, at the request of the Attorney General, 
uh, met with Attorney General Robert Kennedy in which he asked uh, Jimmy Baldwin to convene a meeting and to meet with the Attorney General Robert Kennedy was uh, uh, Lena Horn, Harry Belafonte, James Baldwin, um, 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 the, uh, uh, the person who wrote uh, um, Raising the Sun? Yeah, yeah, Lorraine, Lorraine Hansberry, Hansberry, obviously. Hansberry. Mm -hmm. But I'm thinking about the, 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 uh, the professor. Oh, God, what's wrong with my mind? Uh, who, who, who did the doll test? Oh. Uh, John, uh, Professor Clark. Clark, Kim Clark. Clark. So he had all these yeah. in, in this room sitting. And, and of course, there was a fellow, uh, from a SNCC worker from, uh, from Louisiana whose head was bandaged. Uh, part of the meeting, and Lorraine Hansberry said to the Attorney General, the person he should be listening to was Jerome Smith, is his name. Right. There came a point where the Attorney General was, good, was very agitated because he, he, the question was, uh, who of us, would, would all of us volunteer if there was a, an imaginary war with the, with, with, with the, with the then Soviet Union? Yeah. And, and Jerome, Jerome Smith said, hell no, I ain't doing that, and so forth. Well, Jimmy, Jimmy, James, I mean, the Attorney General was shocked at his reaction. But what the most profound thing that the Attorney General said to all of us, he said, you know, one day, in 40 years, you know, there could be a Negro president in the United States. Mm. Wow. And I said, yeah, I think that's possible. Wow. I think that's possible. But I often, uh, what you said earlier, yes, sir. when you describe what I call the contemporary pursuit of black excellence, mm -hmm. hmm? And the world's reaction, both the black world, the general world, mm -hmm. to the pursuit of being the very best that you can be. Regrettably, some people still today, some people, and this is more in your area than in my, I'm just an observer, still have a problem with the articulated pursuit of black excellence. Yes. Now, now I'm not going to use uh, those uh, freighted words filled with a lot of baggage, like racism. That's, that word is tossed around a lot. Yep. You, my friend, not only in the extended series, of course, This Is Us. But you are part of a generation of the pursuit of excellence in theater and acting that carries forward the legacy of Lorraine Hansberry, James Baldwin, So many others, you know, and it's you should be very proud of that. Absolutely. You should be very, very proud of that you. because you, you are a living example of the pursuit of excellence. Yeah. Thank you, sir. You don't understand that? Okay. Yes. You know, it's Dr. Jones. And I like to believe, uh, I like to believe that every time I write is that I have an advantage because I write because I hear music in the words that I write. The reason I'm such an effective speech writer is because when I write words, I write music. And when you write words and music and they're together, you are a bad brother <laughs> or sister, as the words may be. We are getting close. I told y'all there's no way we can <laughs> even like touch the tip of the iceberg. Um, but I want to sort of wind up our questions. I, I, we have a choice. Okay. 
One could be to talk about what legacy you want to leave. Mm -hmm. One could be for each of you to ask the other one a question. I like the last option, right? I think the audience That's told you right? which way they want to so, go. That's why I threw it out there. I thought <clears throat> y'all'd give me some feedback. So, Dr. Jones, if you could ask Sterling any question, what would you want to know? What would you ask him? Oh, this is wow. exciting. <laughs> How are you able to maintain, at least to apparently maintain, mm. the third parties observing you? How are you able to maintain such a disciplined commitment to the pursuit of excellence mm. and be so proud to be black? All right. All right. That's, that's a great question. It's a good question, Dr. Jones. <laughs> uh, I think I'm keenly aware with everything that I do that I, I walk upon the shoulders of giants. Uh, you want to be the, the fulfilling of a promise that too much sacrifice has been made in our collective history for me to be here. Mm, yes. And, and so I think with each step I take, it is with the knowledge, with the, with, the, with the humility of knowing that I could not be here if it weren't for you. Like, I could not be here right now if you... You're talking about Paul Robeson and Lorraine Hansberry and James Baldwin and Sidney Poitier and Harry Belafonte, et cetera, like that. I could not be here if, if these individuals had not forged a path for it to be easier for me and that I have a responsibility to make it a little bit easier for anybody that comes after me. Come on now. Yes. So that's, come on now. Ooh. You just, did, you just did a rap between the Baptist Church and the Catholic nuns <laughs> ring. So, Dr. Jones, we are so close to time. Yeah. But I really, um, well, Sterling, what question do you have for Dr. Jones? See, I feel I'm, I'm having PTSD because I see, the, see clock the clock going down. I, know, I remember I know, when I got cut off. I know. I got cut off one time on the speech. Um, <laughs> what speech was that, Sterling? I want to, I want to, <laughs> I want to end me, stop. Um, I, I was going to ask you actually, Dr. Jones, because you said in the book a couple of times, and you were, in that Paul Robeson part, you were talking about how he emphasized that America was a celebrity culture. And I remember on the, uh, the march on Washington, you were responsible, I can't remember, it was like the celebrity delegation, and Harry was there, and, and, and a lot of other, Charlton Heston, a lot of other people, and you, you recognized that their presence made a difference. What do you think about America's sort of uh, feeling towards celebrity culture? Is it, a, a, does it make sense to you? Is it worthy? Why do you think it is the way that it is? I think it's sick. Okay. <laughs> okay. I think it. I think the uh, the preoccupations are concerned with with what I call celebrity culture. By definition, um, 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 by definition, um, degrades and puts secondary the pursuit of excellence. Mm. The pursuit of excellence knows no gender, knows no color, knows nothing but the pursuit of excellence. Okay? Yeah. Okay? I mean, you are a living exemplar of the pursuit of excellence. Mm. That's it. Yeah. End of story. Well. <laughs> You, you, you got me with that one. Um, and now we have... This dude, man. I know. I know. 
<laughs> we have a, a couple questions from some of our USF students. Okay. So our first question comes from Samantha Marquez. And Samantha, are you in the audience? Okay. Nope. Uh, so can we play the video? Hi, my name is Sammy Marquez, a junior communication studies major. Sterling K. Brown, as a public figure, what challenges do you face in promoting on your platform for social justice? Softball, softball question. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's a very interesting thing because what I was struck by in, in Dr. Jones's book is the level of organization and the detail of planning that went behind the movement. So when you're an individual on your own with your phone and you're like, oh, maybe I should make a post about this or about that, what have you. Like, I, I, there's so many times that I've thought about posting things and I've either written it down or I've recorded the video and then I've watched the video and then I was like, you know what? You have to be willing to stand behind your words or your video, whatever it is that you've done, and be like, I can articulate why I put this out into the world and why it was important to me. And so 80% get deleted. I was like, I don't, you know, I don't know enough. <laughs> you know, it's like real, real talk. I don't know enough. And I know you're going to be talking soon, sir, about how silence isn't an option anymore. But I also don't know if it's an option to just run your mouth and you don't got all the information that you need. Right? So in, in, in that lack of silence means that you necessarily have to educate yourself and able to be able to articulate your point of view and your perspective, right? right. So I, I say, if you're just using your platform and you're on IG or as Elon Musk calls it, X, like, first of all, I don't like X. Like, it's just, <laughs> bro, it scares me. <laughs> but if I'm on my IG or whatnot, like, talk to somebody. Get a brain trust. Like, these... These men and women were getting together in groups and discussing things ad nauseum, yes. banding about ideas until the best ideas sort of took hold. You ain't got to do it all by yourself. I, I right. think that's probably the best thing I right. can right. get. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. <clears throat> Our um, final student question is from Edgar Mendez. And Edgar's not able to join us in person. So can we see the video? Hi, my name is Edgar Mendez. I'm a student in the MBA program at USF. What advice do you have for current students? Simple. <laughs> yes, Dr. Jones, what advice do you have for current students? Um, put down your cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> and your laptop. And read, read, read. Read, read. We, there is an accumulation of knowledge in books of people who have gone before us. I mean, I mean, if you have not read Darwin's Origins of the Species, if you have not read The Golden Bough, if you're not read Crime and Punishment, mm -hmm. if you're not read, I mean, you have not actually looked and read the words, mm. the, use of, the use of the words. And clearly, if you haven't read, if you haven't read the, the use of the words that James Baldwin mm. wrote, how he used words. You haven't read Tolstoy, Crime and Punishment. You haven't, you, you know, put the cell phone down, put the laptop down, because there's just an enormous treasure trove of people who went before us, and they thought about things, and they thought about how you use words to express things. And of course, one of the greatest persons in the English language is William Shakespeare. I mean, am I, am I, do I sound like some old fart up here? Somewhere? No, sir. No. I mean, words are beautiful. Words, words, words. Shakespeare. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> yes. <It's> good. Yes. <laughs> 
Pastor. Advice? Um, listen, I think sometimes we get preoccupied with the how we're going to do something. I think we need to be more focused on the why. Mm -hmm. If you have a good answer for the why, the how sometimes will take care of itself. Don't let the how keep you from moving forward. If the motivation for what it is that you want to do, the vision that you see of yourself in the world or the world that you want to affect, trust that and the how will sort of come to the surface. That's what I'm saying. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So at this point, um, we're actually going to have Father Paul come to the stage. So, uh, Mr. Brown, Dr. Jones, Dr. Sears, uh, this has been an amazing evening. Rich, so rich in ideas. You know, Clarence, you asked us, you know, do, do we listen to Dr. Martin Luther King? Do we listen to Malcolm X? Do we listen to both? Both important voices. Um, Mr. Brown, you said, you know, to entertain, to educate and to edify. That's what we're doing here. You know, we want to have a community of joy, a community of celebration, a community of performance. Within that, a, a great education takes place. And then it's an edifying education. And of course, to edify is to build, to build a better future for, for all of us. Uh, you talked about going with God. We want all of our students to learn to discern. You know, don't just take the better paying job or don't just take the path that leads to more glory, but take the path that leads you to joy, Amen. that leads you to meaning, and that in, in, in the end is a vocation. You know, God calls us. Um, Dr. Jones, you've told this story many times, but I, I never cease to wonder about those sisters of the Blessed Sacrament who taught you the most important lesson of your life over and over again, that you were created in the image and likeness of God, right. that you're beautiful, That's that you're right. loved. Right. And you have made that founding insight the foundation of your entire career, yeah. and especially of the Institute for Nonviolence and Social Justice here at USF, and the course you taught for a decade from slavery to Obama. Your life work and the work of this institute is to help each one of us to become an agent who can help other people see themselves and each other as image and likeness of God. That would lead to justice. Um, Mr. Brown, investment in human capital, accomplishment, confidence, and so then opportunities arise and doors open because people show you respect. They show us respect. Uh, Mr. Brown, you said that you walk upon the shoulders of giants. Um, the point of history is to bring, as Dr. Jones was just saying, to bring the words of the old poets back into the conversation. You know, tradition is democracy for the dead. <laughs> mm. Just because you're dead doesn't mean you can't still be part of the conversation. Uh, in the Catholic tradition, we say that tradition is the living faith of the dead. And finally, uh, Education is uh, leading us to educated activism, educated engagement for justice. And that justice is a communal project. It's not something I do by myself, but it's something that arises out of a community. So this conversation uh, between generations has been amazing and wonderful. It reminds me of a conversation we had a few years back between you and Steph Curry. Yes. If you haven't seen it, just Google it. It's worth an hour of your life, or four hours if you watch it three more times. <laughs> Find it. Um, it's really deep. Um, and then there was a connection that happened between Clarence Jones and Steph Curry, such that a few years later, Steph Curry was awarded the Kareem Abdul-Jabbar Award for Social Justice. He was given $100,000 to donate to the charity of his choice, and he donated it to the Institute for Nonviolence and Social Justice here at the University of San Francisco. 
at this point, I'd like to uh, invite Clarence's founding partner in establishing the Institute, uh, and uh, who will take us home tonight, Jonathan Greenberg. Jonathan, Jonathan, yeah. before you speak, I, want, I just want to acknowledge the lasting imprint of the Irish nuns upon me, because I have a young man who's a godson to me. He's like a son to me. His name is, uh, what's his name now? <laughs> I'm just kidding. His name is Stuart Conway, as Irish as he can be, and he's like a, a son to me. Stuart, will you stand up? That's my godson. He works with me in all my writings. Thank you. Thank you. As you can see, we're so thrilled that everyone has a copy of The Last of the Lions, An African-American Journey and Memoir by Dr. Clarence B. Jones, together with Stuart Connolly. So thank you for being here. And also, I have to say that we're here tonight in part because of Stuart's close relationship uh, with Sterling K. Brown. So we're all connected, and I feel that so deeply. Thinking about legacy and life, you know, legacy, this is Black History Month, and if you can tell me where to go. <laughs> if you can tell me where to go, where someone's going to talk about their personal experiences with W.E.B. Du Bois and Paul Robeson and Malcolm X and Harry Belafonte and James Baldwin and, 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 uh, and on and on, Muhammad Ali, um, please let me know because I want to go. <laughs> okay? This is not history that you read in a book. This is life. It's our living legacy. And Sterling Brown talked about the shoulders of giants. This is what we stand on. This is what's carried forward. This is black history. But James Baldwin said this is American history. Yes. And Forgive me, Sterling, please forgive me, but this is us, you know? <laughs> it is. It is. And this is the legacy we carry forward at the Institute for Nonviolence and Social Justice. It's an unbelievable blessing to have the direct lineage from Martin Luther King Jr. through Dr. Clarence B. Jones the demand and responsibility. This is what it means, what Sterling Brown was talking about. Standing on the shoulders of giants is a responsibility. We have an obligation to carry forward the struggles that are continuing and unfortunately intensifying because of backlash and, 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 and violence and repression. We have an obligation to continue this journey so, um, and also, the ear training, I'm sorry, I love the flow of creativity, artistic creativity with justice. That's a powerful message that I take. <clears throat> Dr. Jones talked about ear training classes at Juilliard School of Music. Because of those training, he could hear the pulse and the rhythm and the variation and Martin Luther King's voice, and he could write for Dr. King some of the most important texts in 20th century American history because he went to ear training classes at Juilliard. Mm. And I heard from Sterling K. Brown, we need to have ear training so we can hear what our calling is, so we can be the authentic self that he's calling us to be. And when we can hear that calling, then we can follow that calling. And that's the way we're going to live most with most impact. So anyway, I'm, forgive me for my inspiration. This was a deeply meaningful conversation. But I want to say before I begin, I'd like to have one more round of applause for our featured guest, Dr. Jones. Thank you. 
Sterling K. Brown. And, and our magnificent moderator, Dr. Stephanie Sears. <laughs> Ten years ago, I met an extraordinary human being, Dr. Clarence B. Jones. It's been my honor and my joy to work closely together ever since. In 2019, Dr. Jones and I co-founded the USF Institute for Nonviolence and Social Justice. Today, our institute is the leading university-based research, teaching, and advocacy institute furthering nonviolence as practiced by Clarence's beloved friend, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. <laughs> this evening's profound conversation between Dr. Jones and the marvelous, inspiring Sterling K. Brown highlights a core theme of our Institute's work, which is exactly about carrying forward the legacy that Stephanie Sears, Dr. Sears was talking about, which is engaging intergenerational relationships to create the beloved community that Dr. King envisioned, bringing the gift of Dr. King's moral vision and legacy to new generations of students and community activists now and into the future. This is a time of war and hatred and division in our country and in the world. The urgency of our responsibility as an institute to further peace and dialogue, justice and reconciliation is, is, is increases every day. Part of what I need to do is let you know that there will be on the screens a QR code. If you would like to support our work, we would be very grateful. It takes you to the donation page of our institute, or you can find it on our website. Your gift makes it possible for our work to extend from the USF classroom to farm workers in Half Moon Bay, refugees in San Francisco and throughout the Bay Area, and school students in the SF Unified School District. And I want to highlight one special program that was mentioned earlier this evening, the impactful partnership of the Silk family and Derek Brown uh, from the McCarthy Center providing financial literacy programs for middle school students in underserved communities in this city. <laughs> through, the, through our affiliated faculty and grassroots partners, our institute engages in nonviolence research and education projects here in San Francisco and in communities throughout the world, in Asia, Africa, Central and South America. In this time of disconnection, anger, and fear, we invite all of you to join us in our work. And I want to specifically say in this March, we're having an interfaith gathering that we're organizing at Grace Cathedral this April at the historic Third Baptist Church, and everyone is invited to be part of our community, because you are. The transformative impact of our work is because of your engagement and your generosity. None of this work can happen without our community support, and you are our community. On behalf of Dr. Jones and our institute and all of our community stakeholders, we're immensely grateful for all of your support. Please join me in thanking the Silk family, Provost Eileen Fung, uh, President Fitzgerald, Dr. Stephanie Sears, Dr. Clarence B. Jones, and Sterling K. Brown. Thank you all. Have a good evening and travel home safely. Thank you, everyone. All right. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, I'm a member of Delta. Yeah.